Okay, thank you. Uh, I changed the title because I think this title goes better with the day uh, because all my talk will be around the conjecture of Mazur. And also uh, a collaborator of mine is a recent student of uh, Alexander Goncharov, <laughs> Veselin Dimitrov. Okay, uh, so first of all, uh, is <coughs> the motivation is Uh, let's start with Fortinsys theorem. Uh, in, in my whole talk, I'll fix g to be a number uh, to be an integer at least two, and c is a smooth projective irreducible curve defined over q bar. The motivation is uh, first Fortins proved in 1983 that if c has genius, <coughs> has genius at least two defined over a number field k, of degree d, then c has finitely many rational points. So this is the model conjecture. Um, this proof also gives a um, sort of ad hoc upper bound on this number. Uh, it's on g and d and the faulting's height and the Abel Jacobi rank and so on. But the bound is really not explicit and an ad hoc one. Uh, around 90s, Voita gave a new proof to faulting's theorem using our claw of geometry and more in the, t uh, in the sense of Dufan time method which was simplified by Faultings and further simplified by Bombieri, purely in terms of Dufantine geometry. Uh, it's a new proof of the same result, but also at the same time gives a rather a good bound on it. So the bound is in terms of the genus, the degree of the, the, degree of the number field, the Faultings height, of the Jacobian of this curve and the model weight rank. And the model weight rank. <laughs> All these numbers are explicit in this bound. And later on, the bound was improved by David Philippon and Raymond and so on. But it remains in this term. Um, <coughs> so this is in theory, this kind of a computable expression. Yes. It yes. doesn't involve. A on, but on the other hand, the height of the points is not bound, is not known to be. No, 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 no. This is not that is effective version, but uh, no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mazur asked the following question. First of all, in '96, uh, this is a conjecture. Uh, later on, it was simplified. Um, <coughs> I, I will state it in, the, in its most general form, maybe maybe here, because this is the conjecture I, I'm going to study. Let's take any algebraic point P0 in C, in C and let's consider the Abel Jacobi embedding via this point. We take any finite rank subgroup of JQ bar, say of rank R. Then we hope that the cardinality of the following points, the points on C intersect this finite rank subgroup. It has a sort of not really uniform, but it is not uniform only in terms of the rank. So this bound does not depend on the choice of the point, first of all. And also, it does not depend on the, on the finite rank subgroup as long as the rank is fixed. This was the original conjecture, uh, <coughs> this was the original conjecture made by Mazur. Afterwards, there were some simplified version. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about some. <coughs> and my main result today is This is a forthcoming paper with uh, Veselin Dimitrov and Philip Habegger. Is that 
we can prove this inequality for large curves. Large in the sense that for any fixed g, there exists a number depending only on g, such that as long as the height of the curve is larger than delta, then this inequality holds. Height of the Jacobian. Yeah, height of the Jacobian or the curve. Some, some, some people also define it as the curve, as the height of the curve. Um, this <coughs> Um, some, some, some immediate application of this theorem. First of all, particular cases if we take P naught to be a rational point and gamma to be JK, which is a finitely generated subgroup, then our bound here will say that the number of rational points is uniformly bounded in terms of G, D, and the rank. Here, the dependence on D is really artificial. It is there because we have this uh, restriction of large curves. And D is here only because if we fix D, then there are only finitely many curves with, uh, with small heights. So the dependence on D is only here. And this is actually uh, another version of Mazur's conjecture, uh, this one. Uh, secondly, if we take P0 to be, say, any Q bar point, but gamma to be the subgroup of torsion points. Uh, right here, uh, we only take finite rank subgroup, and this is a rank zero subgroup. Then we have a bound that uh, I'll just use CQ bar tall to denote it, but this really depends also on the P naught we chose at the beginning. So this is the size of the torsion packets, if you know that the, 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 the the terminology, it's depend, it depends uniformly on G and D. Again, this dependence on D is really artificial. And of course, it shouldn't even be there, from this for, especially for the second one. And currently, known results for the first one. Um, in this direction, David and Philip Wong proved it for uh, the case when J is a subvariety of copies of, ellipt of copies of the same elliptic curve. And they also find some examples, David and Nakamaye and Philip Bohm also produced some examples of families uh, satisfying this. Um, and for the second one, there's a recent paper of Holy uh, Laura DeMarco and yeah, they prove this for g equals 2 by elliptic. But their result is, uh, is stronger than ours in this case, because they have no dependence on d. They really prove this. Otherwise, there are some results in these directions using the Shabotti Coleman method. But all of them, of, of course, there's, there's some uh, rank condition on the curve. Now let me quickly go through the method of Bombieri, Fultings, and Voita to see some, some input we need. And our proof is based on the second, the, the second proof of, of model conjecture. Um, recall that if we have uh, J, the Jacobian of C, on J, we fix a symmetric Ample line bundle L. Then this L defines a function from the Q bar points to non-negative real numbers. 
is called in the Hontate height function, um, it satisfies two properties. First of all, this function is a quadratic, it defines a quadratic form, uh, or simply in this term, if we take the multiplication by n of the height, it is n square of the height of the original point. And secondly, it vanishes precisely on the torsion points. On the torsion point. Now, if we want to fix our finite rank subgroup gamma in JQ bar, we can always do a map from gamma to gamma tensor R. Gamma to gamma tensor R. And here in this step, this is almost injective, ex except that we lose all the information for the torsion. But here, we also lose all the information for the, to for the torsion. So actually, in terms of the height function and this gamma mapping to gamma tensor R, actually, we're losing the same kind of information. So we can use it to study this. Um, and it is known that, first of all, this is just uh, RR and HL hat square root defines a norm on it. Just by the linear ex just by the linear extension of this function. All right. Now we divide gamma into two sets. For this, for simplicity, I'll just present a case where gamma is finally generated. For example, the rational point case, just for simplicity. Gamma finally generated. Then in this case, when we embed gamma into gamma tensor R, we obtain a Euclidean space here. And um, <coughs> gamma. will become a lattice in this Euclidean space, normal Euclidean space. And the division, and Bombieri, Fulton, Zweitai, and their method, they divided the points in gamma into, into two sets, the set which we call the set of small points and large points, in the following way. They found a C0. I'll explain later this, this number. And divide it into small points, which are the points with height smaller or equal to C0, and the set of large points. So you may guess is the points with height larger than this number. OK, now we have, say, this is the origin. Say this is the origin. And C0 is here, the radius. Now, the set of small points is here. The set of large points is outside this ball. Well. For model, it is immediate that the, set, the set of small point is a finite set. If I restrict to finite generated group just because it's a lattice and contained in a, in a closed ball, so it's automatically finite. So for the sake of model conjecture, we don't need to do anything for these small points. But then bounding the number of large points is what we need. And this is what, what is done in the method. So theorem. This is uh, Voita, Fautins, Bumbieri. And then it was later on strengthened by David Philippon and Raymond. That the number of large points is uniformly bounded in terms of, I think it's seven. Uh, I'll just write it C prime G one plus R. Uh, C prime G R, sorry. The number of large points is, is already uh, uniformly bounded. Actually, this number is G times seven to the power of R. But yeah, let, let me state it in this way. Every, every term is. And uh, David Philippon and Raymond, they also proved this result for uh, finitely rank, finite rank subgroup. 
so that this part, it actually works also for finite rank subgroup. And they prove it using uh, the Manfold gap principle. plus the so-called Voita inequality. So this is uh, a review of the bombelli faultings Voita method. It tells us that now, in order to study Mazur's conjecture, we only need to study the set of small points, which for model is the automatic thing, but now it's the hard thing. Uh, before, okay. And they found this C naught. So, fact. The property of C naught is that it is linearly in terms of the faulting height of the Jacobian. This is how they constructed the C naught. The whole point is to find a good C naught such that the, this uh, void inequality holds. All right. Okay. Now we see that we want to study this set of small points with norm with height bounded linearly in terms of the HFJ. And we want to bound the number of these points like uh, independent of this uh, HFJ. So what we do is, so it suffices to prove the following thing. Small points are far from each other. Or in mass terms, if we have any two small points in gamma, actually, we, 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 will, we will prove it for any points in JQ bar, then their distance defined by the Nihonte tight called Nihonte di distance is uniformly bounded in terms of G and HFJ. And uh, we cannot prove it for the moment, but we can prove it plus some number, Let's say delta not G. And this number is why we are constrict, uh, we are restricted to the small, uh, the large, large curves. Okay. I'm sorry, what is the remainder? It's just a number depending only on g. This is what we can prove. But actually, if we, we can prove this term, then we prove the full uh, measures can get in its. Form. Would you write, write it clearer? I can What we can do, yeah. What we can do is this. Everything is positive here. Oh no. Uh, everything is positive. But yeah, everything's positive. Uh, this may be negative. Ah, this is the yeah. problem. This yeah, is yeah, yeah, yeah. this is the this is the reason why you yeah. are limited. Otherwise, you will never bound. And yes. Okay, so. Just height can be zero. Don't mark Height of p minus q can be zero. It can be zero. So so that's why this bound. Is yeah. This. Yeah. You mean different small points or, or? Difference of small points. That's the difference. P is different from Q, I yeah. suppose. Uh, it could be the same. If it's the same, then this is zero here. And it just says that the height of the curve is small. Because this is a negative number, I'm sorry. Yeah. If this is zero here, then we will have zero greater or equal to a positive number times HFJ plus a negative number. Yes. So that means the, the height HFJ here is small. I, th I think you really do want to take, take different points. Yes. Yes. Otherwise, you'd be able to just conclude by taking P equals Q that the height must be. Oh, yeah, oh OK, I see. I see. I see your point. Yeah, sorry. But, but yeah, what I want to say probably is that P minus Q could be torsion. P minus Q could be torsion. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. But actually, what we prove is not just for gamma, but really for JQ bar with this term. So that we're done. Uh, let me write down exactly what we do. We prove the following height inequality. Uh, we prove the following height inequality for one parameter families. Uh, this is a theorem. Uh, yeah, in, in my talk, because it's a, it's, a, it's a project, it concerns several papers. So I will, I will make it precise which papers are published, which are 
preprints and which one is forthcoming. <laughs> um, this one is a published one <coughs> this year. It, pre it basically shows that this is true for one parameter families. So let S be a curve, again, smooth but not projective curve defined over Q bar. And let A to S be an abelian scheme of relative dimension G. And L be a symmetric relatively ample line bundle on it. So that now we have a fiber-wise defined Nehote height. Um, <coughs> let x be an irreducible subvariety, dominant or not, it doesn't matter. Close irreducible subvariety. Then, OK, this is the setting. I may want to use. You said that you expect this to hold without the extra term delta not g? Yeah, but under certain conditions. But then it means that there is no difference, which is a non-zero torsion point, or it's, it seems uh, too strong? Yeah, yeah, maybe I shouldn't say that, because when we put everything in a family, we see exactly what we expect or not. Yeah. When we put everything in family, we see more clearly what is expected. But here I want to explain the idea of what should be proved to get this result. So you don't claim that you think that that... No, 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 I don't claim that. I don't claim that. I just say that if that could be proved, then the conjecture is solved. But no. <laughs> All right. Now, we assume that this x satisfies some condition, which I'll call non-degenerate. I'll explain what it means in a later in my talk, non-degenerate. Then we have two conclusions. First of all is if x is non-degenerate, then we sort of can compare two height functions. The first height function is fiber-wise defined. The second height function is completely on the base. Write it. There exists a number depending only on x, and it's RST open, non empty subset of x such that the following inequality holds if we consider um, if we consider um, <coughs> if we consider the two height functions, first of all. Uh, let me first of all finish this and then explain what I mean. Okay. First of all, my s, small s, is just a point on the base curve. So this function, it means that, it, it actually means hfas, but I write it in this way to emphasize the fact that this function is completely on the base. It does not really depend on the path fiber. And this point P lies in this Zarsky open dense subset, but is also on the fiber in, uh, on the fiber over S. So the, the, uh, this, this height function is really the fiber-wise defined Nihonte height function I talked above, uh, which is above. So the left-hand side is something depending purely on the fiber. The right-hand side is something depending purely on the base. A priori, there is no relation between them. We can't, ha we can't expect to have a bound. But here, what we proved is that if we assume, uh, if we restrict to a sub right, he's satisfying some property, then these two heights can be bounded. And of course, in order to make this useful, we need to, we need to say that what is nine degenerate. Uh, there is an original definition, but it's ad hoc. So here, we also prove that, uh, we also give a criterion of this non-degeneracy. 
x is degenerate if and only if it's very rigid from geometry. It's simply the translate of an abelian subscheme translated by a torsion section, then by, uh, I would say, something constant. This means that the abelian scheme may have a constant part, isotrivial part, and then uh, the other part of x is just a, a, constant, a, a, trivial a trivial product up to a finite covering. So uh, in practice, we prove that in practice, we can often check this condition to determine whether x is degenerate or not. And then if it's not, then we can apply this. I'll give you an example. Uh, assume that x is uh, dominant over s. Uh, yes, it's better to assume it, but uh, otherwise these, these whole things work because this is just one number then. <laughs> yeah. L let me assume this. Yeah. Why not? And, uh, but it is not necessarily absolutely irreducible, only irreducible? Absolutely irreducible. But Everything is defined over q-bar, so it's absolutely irreducible or irreducible. Uh, no, in the, in the total space, but in the yes. general fiber, it is... Uh, Oh, no, it's not as well. Yeah, so when you add to, uh, This also may not be irreducible. I, I, I say abelian subscheme, but of course, I mean up to a finite covering with base change, then it's abelian subscheme. You mean the finite cover of S? Yeah. Ah, so up to a finite cover of S, yes, it's, yes, uh, yes. it's like... Yeah, 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 okay, up to a finite covering of S. Yeah. I'm sorry, what happens if uh, A to S is just a product? It would seem that the two heights are independent. Uh, then if X is not a constant, then they are not independent. Sorry? If X is not, in, if X is not constant, then they are not independent. Then this height inequality holds if and only if this x is not a constant thing. So, so this, this result a priori also applies to constant abelian scheme. Yes, it does. Uh, the example is, uh, this is a preprint uh, with the three authors. We proved this uh, conjecture, the, the theorem for one-parameter families. Let, let's have a look. Now, suppose we have a one-parameter family of curves of genius at least two. Uh, for simplicity, I'll assume G is at least three. Just for some, some reasons, we will see. Um, then, we consider it's relative Jacobian. Well, there's no canonical way to embed C into J. But because we want But because actually here, we don't care about the actual heights of those points, but the distance of those points. So the height of the, the difference of two points. So we only need to care about this subvariety, C minus C in J, which is well defined, because it can be defined as the image of this, uh, this fiber product to J, where this is fiberwise defined by sending PQ to P minus Q fiberwise. So we don't need to even uh, fix a section for the base of the about Jacobi embedding. OK, let's call this one our sub variety X. And of course, this will be the A over S. Then. <coughs> The assumption of g at least 3, this will imply that x is not, oh, sorry, a non isotrivial trivial family. Isotrivial. Then this assumption will say that uh, x is non degenerate. Just by computation by hand, x will be non degenerate by this geometric criterion. Now we can apply this height inequality. Then, if we take two points on the same fiber of, uh, of C over S, it's which are equal to um, this C depending only on X, so S, so C, and so on, um, times the faulting height of the base point, the base point. Of course, for PQ satisfying those conditions. 
but this is an open condition for the rest uh, points. For the rest of points, we use those packaging arguments. But at least now we see that because this number it depends only on the family, not each individual fiber. So we can see that now we really have this result. So the height of uh, the <coughs> the distance of any two points, algebra points, are uniformly bounded below linearly in terms of the faulting's height. And this is what we want to P prove this. From Q again or not? Yes, P is different from Q again. Thank you. So this tells you that if the difference is torsion, then you get still some consequence. Yes, if it's torsion, then the 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 height of the curve itself is bounded above. And the P and Q are small. No, they are small. They are then then the curve is small. Say. But you don't say that if there is a small point, the curve is. You only say if there is a torsion point. <coughs> the torsion difference of small points, the curve is small. Yeah, well, if, if here P minus Q is a torsion, then the curve is small. Yeah. So that. It can be negative, but I mean, we. I mean, I mean we can take different uh, normalizations to make it positive. There are, there are different normalizations, because yeah. our, our... Yeah, but which normalization? Some, some convenience. Some convenience of normalization so that this is positive, it's actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, my, in my thought, plotting time will always be positive. Yeah. The, the thing is, actually, we, we prove this purely in terms of height machine. So it's OK to, hide, to, add, a, to add a number to this, yeah, or one to this height function. And this basically proves the theorem for one-parameter families, up to some uh, details for the packaging argument. OK, now, I hope I convinced you that if we can generalize this height inequality for arbitrary families of abelian varieties, then we're, we, we can prove the theorem. And then uh, next comes the generalization. And to do that, I will need to explain what is this non-degenerate. You will see that it comes from geometry. <coughs> um, to do this, <coughs> because we want to solve this conjecture, we can just work with the universal curve. And the, this is the modular space. This is the universal curve. It does not have a section, but still, it's a universal curve. Uh, here, uh, I'm taking some level structure. And again, I have the universal Jacobian, and I can take this map to construct a CG minus CG inside, inside J, which is well defined, which is well defined. And furthermore, I would like to embed everything in a universal abelian variety using the Torelli, <laughs> Torelli locus, Torelli embedding to embed it into the modular space of abelian varieties, principally polarized modular space of abelian varieties. And uh, here, this one to curly AG, which is the universal family. So in my talk, I will always work with this system. I have the universal Jacobian, and this is the universal abelian variety. And this is the map pi. I'm sorry, you, you fix a level structure? Yes, yes. Uh, because uh, actually, in my talk, everything is for height machine, height inequality, and so on. So uh, taking a finite covering, it's uh, always allowed. It okay, doesn't really. Yes, 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 yes. <coughs> so this is the object we will work on. <coughs> and then. Whatever sub variety we take will be a sub variety of the universal abelian variety, but it may not be dominant. Most of the time, it's not dominant to the base. Irreducible sub variety. Again, geometrically irreducible sub variety defined over Q bar. Okay. And Furthermore, we actually have another object in this picture that is the tautological line bundle. 
this is the, it exists just because the, the modular space parameter tries not only abelian varieties, but each abelian variety is equipped with a polarization, a principal polarization. So this is a tautological line bundle on the universal abelian variety. And <coughs> we can take the first chain class of this line bundle. This non-degenerate condition well, this is not the definition we take, but it's really the geometric meaning behind the definition we will take in a few minutes. Um, <coughs> X is non-degenerate if X, X is called non-degenerate. If we take this first chain class, we restrict it to x, and we take its correct uh, wedge power. It is not always 0. It is not always 0. Well, one thing about this form is that uh, this first string class is always non-negative. This can be computed in explicit or coordinates, and this is done by, I would say, mock, naming mock. <coughs> so this is always non-negative. So saying that this is not always zero means that it's positive somewhere. At one point, it's enough, yeah, because it's a one-one form. We have not come to the boundary, so it's really a form. <coughs> uh, of course, it's hard. Um, <coughs> the geometric meaning of this will be then, well, if x is non-degenerate, then sort of if we want to integrate this thing over x, we will get a positive number. So that is almost equivalent to say that this LG restricted to X is a big line bundle, except that now nothing is projective. So it's really the geometric meaning, the geometric background behind. But uh, yeah, but of course, in order to get something, we need to be more precise. But this is our idea. Uh, our description is as follows. Uh, we use the so-called Betty map introduced by uh, Daniel Bertrand, Umberto Zanier, Gokwara Andre when they studied some other kind of Dufantin problems and uh, unlike the intersection problems. Um, <coughs> the Betty map is defined as follows. Here we take the universal abelian variety. I want to take its universal covering. Well, we know that we take the Ziegler r path space. It, unif it uniformizes in the complex uh, category the moduli space. And here on, this, here on this AG, we want a similar thing. We want a similar thing. And <coughs> it can be defined as follows. Universal covering of AG. I will call this one, uh, I was in very bad notation. I'll temporarily call it YG. Uh, Y2G. First of all, it's defined as follows. First, as set or as real algebraic object, it is R to the 2G times the Ziegler R path space. And then we want to give it a complex structure. And the complex structure should uh, <coughs> encodes the complex structure of every abelian variety over this uh, modular space. So it is actually given in the following way. Here, we take any vector a, b, both in Rg, and a uh, matrix, g by g matrix. We send it to a plus c, b, c. And this is, of course, a bijection. And it's also isomorphism as real varieties, real algebraic varieties. But the complex structure should be this one. Then this is the, uniform, this is the universal covering. I'll use this one. Now we have Y2G uh, covers AG, which maps to HG plus. This is just the trivial product with some twisted complex structure. All right. <coughs> now, x is in AG. I'll take 
and irreducible component, irreducible in the sense of analytic geometry, component of u inverse x, then this is going to be in this uniformizing space. This is going to be in this uniformizing space. And the Betty map is something very, very simple. It's just uh, y2g, when we write it in this way, actually, it projects the first factor. And the Betty map, essentially, is the composition. This is the Betty map. Well, this is something very, very simple, but it encodes, for example, it, we can really read off this condition completely using this very simple map. So I'll give the actual definition which we have. X is non-degenerate if and only if, or if, if and only if. This is definition lemma, maybe. B restricted to x tilde has full rank. The generic rank of this map is twice the dimension of x. So this, <coughs> this is because this 1-1 one, one form, it defines a point-wise a uh, symplectic, uh, symplectic pairing. And the kernel of this symplectic pairing are precisely the fibers of this map. We, this can be computed explicitly. And then saying that this is non-zero precisely means that uh, there should be no, no direction van along x not vanishing along some, some positive direction of the fiber. So this is precisely the definition. And also from this new definition, we do know uh, what kind of subright is degenerate. So from this new de definition, we have that x is degenerate if and only if for any x tuta in this uh, x, uh, big x tuta component, it lies in a fiber. So the dimension of b inverse bx intersect x tuta is positive. The dimension of that is positive. By the way, the fiber is a, the map is just real analytic. It's just real analytic. It's not complex. Okay. The fibers are complex analytic. Ah, and this is used in the verification. Okay. Yes, yes, uh, because it's pure. It's, it varies holomorphically. Thank you. And then this says that now we have actually a curve in HG plus. A complex analytic curve such that if we take bx times this curve, this is inside R2g times Hg plus, it is contained in x tuta. It's containing that for each x tuta. And then it means, simply means that x tuta is covered by such things. Uh, I will use such things. So the C tilde is just a local curve. Is a yeah, but it's complex analytic. Uh, you can use analytic extension some, somehow. Yeah, but it is, it is just defined a small neighborhood. Yes, 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 a priori, only a small neighborhood. Yes, yes. And here, um, 
I want to say that now then this wholly implies that if x is degenerate, then x is the union of such things. But I can also take the Zariski clue. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, right, right, right. So x, now when we pass to the universal abelian variety, because x is algebraic, so I can take its Zariski closure. So that now x, if x is degenerate, then it is this ad hoc union. It is this ad hoc union. Actually, the other direction also holds uh, by some 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 a lot simpler reasons. But uh, maybe I, if I have time, I'll explain it. But the, the other direction is the simple. Di it's, it also holds. All right. <coughs> now we want to study these things. Now, okay. Now the question is to study. These are C closures. What properties should they have? And this is the next part of my talk, maybe number three, functional transcendence. I'll start with the weak x shanu uh, statement. Um, this is a uh, actually a sort of statement. It says the following thing. If we have two varieties, two algebraic varieties, and this is more or less, this is subjection. This is usually the, uni uh, the uh, <coughs> uniformizing map linked by a trans uh, an analytic map. So both omega and s are supposed to have some algebraic structure, but q itself is very far from being algebraic. It's highly transcendental, but it's only analytic. Then we cast new says that um, mo things here and things here, they should intersect transversally, except if they, if, except if they actually in, in intersect in a smaller base, meaning that if we have z, inside omega irreducible complex analytic. Again, irreducible in the sense of complex geometry. Then the dimension of z bar inside omega plus the dimension of qz bar inside s is greater or equal to the dimension of z plus the dimension of uh, use qz bizarre. Um, let me explain this term. So we have a bi-algebraic system here. And we say something is bi-algebraic if it is algebraic here and here. That is the bizarre thing. So this is sort of the bi-algebraic closure. Weak section says that this thing, it is in omega. An algebraic thing in omega. And this qz star is an algebraic thing in S. And there's the dimension of their sum is at least the dimension of the z itself plus the qz bar, uh, the bizarre thing. And it means that, it means that these two things, if there is a proper bi-algebraic thing containing both, then they don't intersect pro uh, transversal. Uh, otherwise, they always intersect transversally. So this says that if we have some sort of unlike intersection, then there must be a reason. Yeah. And this reason, we can write it down. Um, this is the result we're going to use. Um, this first, uh, th this kind of uh, result was first by, uh, approved by Ax, of course, to study the Shadow kind of functional, functional analog of Shadow's conjecture. But it got interest again by, uh, by, the uh, by the study of the Andriot conjecture. And uh, it's uh, another, f it's a, a weaker form of, a weaker form, Ax Lindermann was proven by 
uh, clean gravel mow and the FIF. This is for Shimura variety. This is for Andre Alt. But this, but this general form uh, recently is proven by Mark Pilat and Timmerman for the modular space. And this paper is published. It has two uh, extensions, two directions of extensions. First direction is by Baker and Zimmerman. for variation of pure heart structures. Uh, this is also published, and this is used in the recent proof of Lawrence Tanvan and Tesh proof of model conjecture. Actually, it's used for the high dimensional, uh, high dimensional case. Um, another extension is done by me for this uh, universal abelian variety. It's a mixed Shimura variety. It's not pure anymore, but this is a preprint. And uh, in studying this question, studying this y, it is this form I'll use. Now to study that y over there, we see what condition it satisfies. We apply the weak x genu to here z will be r times c tuta. It is also complex analytic, as we said here. And of course, to this system, uh, to the system y2g to ag. You. All right. Well, then, first of all, the first term is dimension z bar, which is the dimension of r times c tuta z r. This is the first term. The second term is precisely y. And the third term is 1. Well, because it's a curve. The third term is 1. And the last term is y by zero. Now, in this inequality, actually, we know many things. This is what we want to know, so we don't need to do any operation on it. This is a number. And this is a bioalgebraic thing. Well, in bioalgebraic geometry, usually these kind of things have very good geometric interpretation, so we don't need to do much about it. So the only thing we need to study is the first term. Well, the first step to do is that this RC closure, although this is not uh, trivial, but it's not very hard, actually, certain things commute. We can first of all do this RC closure of C tuta completely in, in HG, and then do this product. They are actually the same. We can, we can show that. Then the equality becomes something purely in the base plus dimension of y is greater or equal to 1 plus dimension 1 c bar. OK, now let's study this. Well, by the choice of c, we know that y is r times c tuta and take the zero c closure. So of course, this thing is smaller or equal to dimension of pi y bizarre. This is smaller or equal to pi y bizarre. So now we have the inequality being dimension of y is greater than, I remove this one, but then replace this by strictly larger than dimension y by zar minus dimension pi y by zar. OK, this is actually the eventual form we want, we want because both things have very good geometric interpretation. I can also tell you what is this difference. This, differ this difference has an even better geometric interpretation. Say, here we have our universal abelian variety over the modular space. And this is our pi y bizarre. 
the y bytes are is something over that, and it is part of it. This part, it is precisely up to a finite covering. An abelian subscheme translated by a torsion section, then by a constant section or iso constant section. So in some sense, it is the smallest abelian subscheme containing uh, containing this y. It is some, 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 something like that. So now y is something here. Say this is y. And if we restrict the orange part to the, to the yellow part, then y will be contained in no smaller abelian subscheme in this whole thing. Then dimension y being larger than this difference means that the dimension of y is larger than the relative dimension of this abelian scheme. And if we look at the dimension, uh, if we look at the definition of the Betty map, of course, the rank of the Betty map cannot exceed twice the dimension of the original, uh, of the original variety. So that's why, as long as y satisfies this, then of course y is degenerate. And if x is the union of such things, then x must be degenerate. This, this is why I said that the other direction is rather easy to prove. So you say it's an abelian subscheme over what? Over a sub-variety of Ag? Over, yes, over its, over its base. And, and it is plus a section? A torsion section over its base and the constant section over its base. Yeah, now I'm restricted everything in, in, in the base. Yes. The base is fixed. Yes. Yeah. So what is torsion plus? It's translated by a torsion section of this restriction and then by a constant section uh, of this restriction. Of course, when I talk about this, I always, I always mean up to a finite covering. So what the so a torsion section will become constant after the finite curve or not? Yes, it is. It is. I, I just want to separate torsion and constant, but otherwise I can say just constant. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but because in studying this mixture mirror or whatever, this stuff, uh, torsion and constant, they are really very different things. So I, I like to separate them. <laughs> I like to separate them. One of them is special. The other one is wicked special and so on. So, okay. Now, using the mix x channel, uh, we can show that x is really the union of something, that, uh, and still an ad hoc union, but each member of this union have a better interpretation. It satisfies some condition which is more or less standard in unlikely intersection theory. And then next step is really do unlikely intersection. Or maybe like here. So next step, do unlikely intersection. Again, uh, this is um, uh, basically says that the maximal y is satisfying this condition. They come from finally many of families. This actually goes back to even Bogomolov for abelian varieties, and then uh, Emmanuel uh, generalized it to Shimura varieties for, uh, for weekly special sub-varieties. On the other hand, when studying those uh, unlikely intersections, the Zuberpin conjecture, Dao and Ren, uh, Habegger and Pila introduced this weekly optimal thing, and Dao and Ren prove it for Shimura varieties. I, I prove it for mixed Shimura varieties. So we can show that those maximal, maximal y's come from Finally, many families. So eventually, this ad hoc union becomes a finite union. So that it's directly, so that for any x, this union will be directly closed. And also, we we can we can prove a criterion when this directly closed sub variety is the whole thing. Just uh, doing doing this unlikely intersection stuff. I don't think I have time for it. But uh, just if, just back to our counting problem. Back to Mazur's question. Of course, as I said, uh, we want CG minus CG to be non-degenerate. Unfortunately, it's not true, just for stupid reasons, because the dimension of this is too large compared to G. So this is not the correct sub correct x we take. The correct x we take, uh, there are two ways. I'll, I'll take the easy, but uh, I'll take the easy way. It's just 
a fiber product. With piece, um, I think here I can write 3, but I really should write 3g minus 2. Okay, for some for some reasons, for some induction reasons, and of course here I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that g is at least three. Um, if we take this power to be three g minus two, then x is non-degenerate, so that we can prove this height inequality. It says that okay, we cannot prove that all uh, each algebraic each two each pairs of different algebraic points are far from each other, but we can show that around each algebraic point, there are at most 3g minus 2 points, which are not far from it. And for the purpose of counting, that suffices. So for each algebraic point, at most, 3g minus 2 points uh, close to it. Close means that the distance is uh, smaller than a linear function on the on the Fulton's height. Yeah. Then for the purpose of counting, we're done. Just multiply everything by this number, which still is explicit on G. Okay. Uh, I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Well, thank you. Are there any questions? Could you repeat why you have to rule out the case g equals 2? Oh, actually, it's just for you because when g equals 2, this will be the whole thing. Yeah. So whatever power you take, fiber power you take, it will still be degenerate. Okay. Uh, the, the, the way well, we... That point you don't yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, right? But the, the, the way we solve this problem, actually, this is not the, the actual thing we, we take. We take a... Uh, uh, I need to write this. So. The map we take is this is k, so this is this is k. We take is p1 minus p0, pk minus p0. The map we take is actually this one. For this, as long as k is at least two or three, then g equals two will, all, will also be solved at the same time. Yeah. For one parameter families, it's almost equivalent to take th this one and this one doesn't matter. But actually, when we work on this, even for g at least three, it's simpler to take this one just for the proof. Yeah. <coughs> so I think. Uh, with Joharis and Lucia Caforazzo, Barry has been even more optimistic about uh, rational points. Uh, yeah, optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, for, for that thing, I really don't know because it's yeah. a rank yeah. stuff. I can I can do nothing with the rank. Well, that's different. <laughs> yeah. But I have, a, I have a question about yeah. it. Uh, so you do it for finite rank subgroups of JFQ bar and, yes. of course, also J torsion. Yeah. What about a sum of finite rank and J torsion? I think it's it's a finite I mean, rank, it, uh, right? What? It's a finite rank, right? What? It's a finite finite no, no, rank. What do you mean? Um, oh no, no, I, I don't mean that. I mean uh, the visibility of uh, if I allow myself to divide uh, a finite oh, rank by finite. subgroup by uh, integers at n, I get a you know I get a Oh, that's actually what I mean by finite rank. It's Q. That's what you mean yeah, by yeah, yeah. It's Q okay, rank. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For by finite gen finally generated, I mean that it's a Z module a priori. But finite rank is really uh, over Q. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's a divisibility because yeah. in the proof, actually, for the large points, they already solved this problem, and for the height inequality, we don't see. We actually don't see this gamma. Remember, we start again in 10 minutes. Thank you.